Okay, hello. This is a summary of how the United States is starting a new Cold War with Russia. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, current U.S. attacks upon Russia's hydrocarbon pipelines. All right, but first we'll start with a review. Uh, back in 1982, USA tried to block construction of the Soviet's Orengo pipeline, and then uh, we blew it up with a malware attack. Then in 2008, with Ukraine screwing Russia's gas sales to Europe, uh, you know, stealing gas and whatnot, uh, the U.S. pushed hard to get both Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, which jammed Russia with a double strategic threat. Ukraine is a primary route for Russian gas to Europe, and Georgia right here is the route for non-Russian gas to Europe. All right, so it's a double threat. Uh, Russia has been building pipelines to bypass Ukraine because Ukraine has been screwing Russia with theft of gas, non-payment for purchased gas, big unpaid bills for gas, and contract violations. So these are the uh, bypass uh, pipelines. First is Jamal. Jamal went, uh, there's a, a pipeline here. I think uh, Jamal and Northern Lights both go through here, then they cut across Ukraine here, but they wanted to bypass Ukraine going around it with Yamal 2. They didn't build that. Uh, they were also trying to bypass Ukraine with the South Stream down here, uh, but that was canceled by uh, European sanctions in 2014. They did build the Blue Stream here to Turkey, and they did build the Nord Stream 1 to Germany here, and then the Turk Stream 2 to Turkey over on the other side of the uh, uh, Straits there. Uh, and then uh, they're currently trying to build the Nord Stream 2 and the Turk Stream 2, but U.S. is attacking that with sanctions. All right. So USA's uh, stated reason for attacking Russia's Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2 pipelines with sanctions are as follows. All right. So these pipelines threaten European energy, energy security. Uh, these pipelines steal revenue from Ukraine, Poland, and Belarus. And three, these pipelines will supply cheap gas to Europe, which will slow development of renewable energy. Now, each of these reasons are bullshit. All right? So we're going to go through them one at a time why they're bullshit. The first is Russia's threat to Europe's energy security is bullshit because... While Russia did cut off gas to Europe for only three days back in January of 2006 and reduced gas to Europe for three days in October of 2007, that was entirely the fault of Ukraine due to their theft of gas at all, all the other stuff, not paying, whatever, all right? So Russia had to try to apply some leverage on Ukraine, so they did that. Therefore, Ukraine was the underlying cause of any European energy insecurity. And to take it a step further, since the U.S. is trying to force Russia to send gas back through Ukraine, the U.S. is a threat to European energy security. All right. So Russia only cut off gas uh, or reduced gas for three days because threatening European energy security uh, would force Europe to seek and develop alternative sources of gas slash energy which would steal market share from russia and that's exactly what happened with the development of the caspian gas via the trans anatolian pipeline going through turkey cutting into russia's market share in short russia has no interest in threatening european energy security because it is bad business Plain and simple. It screws Russia. So why would they do it? Uh, Russia in no way has monopoly power over European energy because uh, first, only eight countries have high dependence on Russian gas, which is 75% or more. And all of these are Eastern European nations with tiny GDPs, right? They're throwaway economies. Uh, for all but two of these nations, gas is a trivial, insignificant part of their total energy. I'll show you the numbers in a second. And finally, 
they all have tiny overall consumption of gas. So these are the eight uh, nations that have over 75% dependence on uh, Russian gas, right? Something that the USA pushes. In fact, they lied about it. They said there's 11, there's only eight, right? And they didn't, they didn't teach any of, the, uh, any of this uh, about the weakness of the markets here. So those nations are Finland, Northern Macedonia, Moldova. Now think about these nations. These are worthless nations. Bosnia, Latvia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Estonia, right? These have 100%, 93, 9, uh, 89, 79, 79, right? Okay, look at the GDPs here. The largest is Finland, and that's tiny. That's a quarter of a trillion. Not even a trillion, right? And then look at Northern Macedonia, 12.5 billion. Goodness sakes, 12 billion Moldova. 20 billion. 31 billion. Goodness. And then gas as a percentage of total energy is small for all nations except three. Moldova, it's tiny Moldova is 53%. They have heavy uh, reliance. Latvia is 30%. Other than that, you know, you got a bunch of single digits here. Most of them in single digits. Six, nine, five, seven, right? Then you got a 13 and a 14. All right, then look at the overall gas consumption. How much their total amount of gas they're buying, all right? U.S. buys 27,243 million cubic feet annually, right? Uh, and these are the values for these nations. 96 for Finland, 2 for Northern Macedonia. Come on, right? But what's more important is, is to look at it in terms of uh, percentage of U.S. consumption. So Finland consumes about one third of one percent with the u.s that's tiny all right look at northern macedonia it's like nothing all right the largest is uh what's oh largest is bulgaria at 0.4 of one percent not even half of one percent compared to the u.s all of these are tiny so this is russia's big monopoly I mean, it's really a joke, all right? It's blown out of proportion. It's an exaggeration. First of all, the U.S. lies and says 11 nations. That's not true. It's only eight. And the eight nations are a ridiculously small market. Wow, they dominate. And here's the, here's the thing. This is what I'm thinking. Russian gas dominates in these nations because they are such worthless markets making competing investment in pipelines unfeasible right it's not going to pay off to build a pipeline to get gas to these guys it's such a poor market and in most cases it pays off for russia because they got gas going to europe that passes by these nations right not so if you're, if you're right europe has many alternative sources for gas all right uh, it has Dutch gas, North Sea gas, North Africa gas, Caspian gas, Romanian gas, uh, future Turkey gas, because they found a big uh, field in the Black Sea right around here. Uh, liquid natural gas terminals all around Europe. Anywhere where there's water, there's liquid natural gas terminals. All right. Uh... So Russia must compete with these, eliminating monopoly power, forcing Russia to keep its price down. Right? What is monopoly power? The ability to control price. Well, Russia doesn't have that power. Also in markets dominated by Russia, like here, dominated by Russia. Most of these are Balkan nations. Balkans. Uh, Moldova's over here. It's, it's close. That's probably Balkan. 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 Oh, that's Baltic, right? So most of them are Baltic nations from here, right? Now, look at what's available. You got the Brewer pipeline. This is complete now. Phase one of the Brewer, 
right? You got the Trans Anatolian pipeline coming over here, and it's going to tap together here, right? Now these are not yet. There's plans for these pipelines to supply the Balkans, all right? But that's highly questionable. Why? Because the market is so crappy. It's not going to pay off to build the pipes. All right? I mean, who cares if Russia dominates this damn market? It's worthless. So new pipes are being developed and new gas fields. You know, Romania, Turkey. Uh, Europe has alternative sources of other types of energy like electricity. Made from coal, hydropower, wind, solar, nuclear, etc. Right? And less than 5% of Europe's electricity is made from Russian gas. Less than 5%. That's not dependence upon Russia. The rise of renewable energy uh, is another factor. In uh, the past year, 2020, Europe produced more electricity uh, from renewable energy, 38%, than from fossil fuels, both coal and natural gas. All right. So uh, wind and solar, etc., are growing. Lacking monopoly power, Russia must price its gas competitively low, which is a benefit to European economies. Right? Not a threat to European economies. To justify attacking Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2, the USA lied and fudged the numbers claiming 11 nations had over 75% dependence, right? And the U.S. failed to state that all eight nations, there's only eight, not 11, have tiny GDPs, right? And gas is only a small part of their total energy and all consume uh, relatively tiny bits of gas, all right? They're path it's a pathetic market. 11 is an exaggeration of an, of an insignificant market. Also, the U.S. claimed 40% of European gas is Russian when it's actually only 33%. EU gas consumption is falling. All right. Uh, this is according to the Atlantic Council, which is a right-wing conservative think uh, tank. All right. They said having peaked in 2019 at 168 million cubic meters annually it is expected to decline to 120 by 2030 all right let me do the math real quick all right that represents a 29 percent drop almost a third All right, so next argument, Russia's new pipelines bypass Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland, stealing revenues from them, all right? Well, first of all, Russia has a right to determine where it sends its gas. Russia has no obligation to send its gas through Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland, all right? So not sending gas through those countries is not stealing revenues from them. That's their choice. Russia has every reason not to send gas through Ukraine due to their long history of screwing Russia with gas theft. All right? Why why would they why would they go back and send gas to Ukraine when Ukraine's been screwing them? Because Russia would have to pay Ukraine transit fees, USA is forcing a Russia to send gas back to Ukraine is to force Russia to pay extra money to get the uh, uh, the privilege of being screwed by Ukraine, right? Russia's got to pay to get screwed by Ukraine. That's a good deal. And don't forget the threat of Ukraine's bad behavior being protected by NATO military umbrella, giving Russia good reason to bypass Ukraine. So there's a combined threat. Not only is Ukraine a threat of screwing Russia, but it's a bigger threat once they're protected by NATO. It's a combined threat, a multiplied threat. Finally, the argument that sending gas back to Ukraine will make Ukraine more secure 
against Russian invasion is a fallacy, given, first, without Ukraine's bad behavior, Russia has less reason to threaten and invade Ukraine. Right? So, if you totally bypass Ukraine, Russia doesn't have that problem. It doesn't need to threaten Ukraine. Two, there is nothing worth taking in either Ukraine or Belarus in terms of GDP and resources. Nothing. All right? Third, Russia has everything to lose by invading Ukraine in terms of it's going to get whacked with immediate UN, US, EU sanctions. All right? It's going to lose sale of gas and oil to Europe because scared European nations will boycott Russia in fear. Having to fight, they'll have to fight a bloody proxy war in which Ukraine will be well supported by Western weapons, training, intel, etc. And that would bleed Russia dry. Then having to fight a counterinsurgency war in an urban battlefield, which Russia has proven to be a failure at, like in Chechnya. Having the war fuel internal instability. That historically has repeatedly happened to Russia. Revolution. Bad war, revolution. Bad war, revolution. And it's altogether likely, and in fact, is Russia's greatest perceived threat, according to the Rand Corporation analysis of 2019. Now, last is having to risk another breakaway attempt in the North Caucasus. 15 times historically Chechnya has broken away or tried to break away. And the North Caucasus are strategically vital and vulnerable underbelly. Pipelines and hydrocarbon reserves there. All right, so the, the third bullshit reasoning is the Nord Stream 2 threatens investment in clean energy. All right, bullshit. Investment and development of wind and solar is driven by cheap price. That's the bottom line. That's what's driving investment. Because you're going to make pro increased profits. Wind and solar are currently less than half the price per kilowatt hour than the next most efficient form of electric production, uh, which is combined gas steam turbine systems. Less than half the price. Lower prices will reduce energy bills for consumers while still increasing profits for power companies. That's the driver. That's the motivation. Advancing technology. Wind and solar have the greatest potential for technological development, which will improve products and further drive down price of electricity. Uh, burning hydrocarbons, on the other hand, is technologically tapped out. You are not going to squeeze out any more technology for burning coal or gas. It's primitive technology. The vast potential for technological development is in renewable energy and energy storage. The two go hand in hand. And this will drive investment. All right. So another bullshit is the conversion to clean energy has the potential to be an economic engine for economies throughout the world that could last decades. All right. Now, many may remember the 1990s were the dot com or internet, you know, uh, economic engine era. All right. Lasted about a decade. Well, you know, th this transformation to renewable energy is going to take a lot longer. It could drive economies for multiple decades. I'd say at least two. Maybe more. And you know there's still going to be more investment as, to improve technology. All right. Another bullshit. Cheaper energy from wind and solar will be a hedge against inflation, which will allow for more economic growth. That should motivate governments to support clean energy, right? So they're going to get support from governments. It's, that's where you're going to get the drive. This is going to drive uh, another factor that's going to drive investment in clean energy. 
Final bullshit. Given Russia's fragile economy and over-dependence on hydrocarbon exports, the inexorable transition to clean energy and electric transportation can be used as a strategic weapon against Russia. I mean, this is obvious. Anyone should see this. You want, if you really think Russia is, is a threat, and I don't, right? Not militarily and not in terms of what there is to gain from, you know, aggressive action. There's nothing, there's no neighbor around Russia that's worth taking, except to the Far East, and they can't take that. All right? So if, if you think Russia's a threat, you can use this as a weapon against Russia. It's going to be a long-term detriment to the Russian economy, that switch. So that can motivate Western government support for clean energy to the extent that they view Russia as a threat, which I believe is bullshit in terms of uh, real capability and intentions, right? No neighbor to the west or the south worth taking. European energy is not threatened by Russia. With so many alternatives, Russia must sell its gas at low competitive prices, which benefits European economies, not threatens them. If anything, Russia is far more threatened with market loss because of its weak and fragile economy that's overly dependent on hydrocarbon exports. Hydrocarbons being 25% of Russia's GDP, a full quarter. Russia's economy has proven vulnerability to hydrocarbons in price demand volatility. I showed you that. Uh, comparing price to price of uh, oil, for example, with uh, Russian uh, GDP growth rate. And this situation will only get worse for Russia as nations increasingly switch to renewable energy and electric transportation. All right? It's just going to get worse and worse. And, you know, this is going to accelerate. All right? The whole notion that it's going to drop by 29%, well, who knows? It could be more because I believe the transition to... Uh, especially to electrified tra uh, transportation, is going to accelerate. The U.S. threatens European energy security by forcing Russia to send gas back to Ukraine, who has been the source of uh, supply instability and European insecurity. Now, this past March of 2021, there was a repeat of the 2008 threat uh, to Russia of NATO expansion. So at the NATO summit on March 23rd to 24th, there was again a big push to get both Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. Right? Russian route for gas, non-Russian route for gas. Russian route for gas if U.S. gets away and destroying Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2. On the first day of the summit, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken voiced his attack on Russia's Nord Stream 2 pipeline and how it stole recent revenues from Ukraine. He promoted U.S. sanctions on the Nord Stream 2, which are an effort to force Russia to again send gas back through Ukraine so they get a little money but Ukraine has been the source and cause of European energy insecurity by screwing Russia. Remember how they had to cut off three days and reduce for three days? Right? That's Ukraine's fault. So once again, Russia was jacked with a combined threat of Ukraine screwing Russia along with protection by NATO military umbrella. Also, Russia will be forced to pay for the privilege of being screwed by Ukraine with gas theft, non-payment, big bills, contract violations. All right? All right. Now, on March 26, right after the NATO summit concluded, pro-Russian separatists violated the ceasefire and lobbed mortar rounds at Ukrainian soldiers, killing four. Now, the very next day, on March 27. Satellite evidence showed a Russian military buildup in Crimea, right? 
Also, Russia built up forces northeast of Ukraine. As, as about 100 or 200 miles northeast of Ukraine. Still fairly close. Now, the Simpleton U.S. media reported this as a likely Russian preparation to invade Ukraine. Right? But this is the exact same threat Russia was jammed with in 2008. Right? This is also a classic Putin move. Faced once again with a threat of NATO military umbrella protecting Ukraine's bad behavior, screwing Russia on gas, Putin more than likely, I mean, I think it's almost certain that it was Putin who got the pro-Russian separatists in eastern Donbass to shell the Ukrainian positions to manufacture an incident that he would use as a pretext to build up forces on Ukraine's border in order to scare away any support for Ukraine joining NATO. That's kind of a mouthful, but you get the idea. New membership in NATO requires unanimous approval of all 30 members of NATO. So Russia had only to scare off one out of the 30. All right. And you know, given the timing, that's what it's all about. It's not about fresh water to Crimea, which Ukraine cut off seven years ago. Why would they suddenly build a force for that now? That's ridiculous. It's this. This is the this is the immediate threat here, and this is a far bigger chunk of their economy than water to Crimea, which is trivial compared to that. In less than a month, on April twenty second, Russia announced a withdrawal of troops. So I was correct. They did invade Ukraine, right? They're just. Uh, posturing to scare away any NATO membership for Ukraine. All right, finally, on May 7th uh, uh, of this year, the Russian group Dark Side hacked the Colonial Pipeline with ransomware, forcing a shutdown that threatened fuel supplies on the U.S. East Coast. All right Now, Biden said there was no evidence of Russian government involvement, and while that may be so, all right, okay, maybe there's no, I fully expect Russian government involvement, given our history of attacking and blowing up their Oregon Guard pipeline, threatening NATO protection for Ukraine and Georgia when Ukraine is screwing Russia, all right, and Georgia is the alternative route for gas to Europe, jamming Russia with a double strategic threat. And also now our current attacks on Russian Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2 pipelines. Russia has every reason to attack our pipelines, and they would not be instigating. They would not be the troublemakers. We're the ones who instigated. We're the ones who initiated. They'd be responding with either retaliation and or deterrence. We'll get you so you don't screw with us again. You're vulnerable. Don't screw with us. All right, so here's a summary. The U.S. has been attacking Russia's Soviet pipelines going back to 1982 when we blew up the Iron Guard pipeline by planting malware in the computer controls. Ukraine used to be the primary route for Russian gas to Europe, 80%. And Ukraine has a long history of screwing Russia with theft of gas, non-payment, big bills, contract violations. In 2008... With Ukraine screwing Russia on gas, the U.S. pushed hard to get NATO membership for uh, Ukraine, which would protect Ukraine's bad behavior, screwing Russia, and for Georgia, which would protect the non-Russian route of gas to Europe. Thus, this jammed Russia with a double threat, which induced Russia to invade Georgia to get them to promise not to join NATO. To evade Ukraine, Ukraine's bad behavior, Russia has built a number of pipelines that bypass Ukraine, including Russia's Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2 pipelines. Today, the USA is attacking the Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2 pipelines with sanctions 
for three bogus reasons. I explained that. I'm not going to explain it all again. Attempting to force Russia to again send gas to Ukraine. This would make Russia pay additional fees for the chance of being screwed again by Ukraine. That's a very good deal indeed. These U.S. attacks are combined with a renewed push to get Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, once again jamming Russia with the risk of NATO military protection for Ukraine's screwing of Russia. Right? I mean, that's a nightmare scenario for Russia. In all likelihood, Russia reacted to this threat with a defensive deterrent move, building up military forces on Ukraine's border to discourage Ukraine's admission into NATO. This was portrayed by the U.S. media, however, as Russian aggressive and a threat of Russian invasion of Ukraine, adding fuel to a cold war between U.S. and Russia and the associated arms race, right? Scaring up support for big military appropriation bills in Congress. And finally, the Russian government denied all responsibility for the colonial pipeline hacks. However, I fully expect their involvement given we have a long history uh, and current efforts at attacking Russia's pipelines. We're attacking them now. Payback is a bitch, but we should expect to get what we give. I mean, just be honest. You gotta be honest here, right? We jacked them. We should expect payback. Nevertheless, this too can be used to fuel a new Cold War with Russia as portrayed as the evil troublemaker. So the U.S. instigates and initiates with attacks and threats, and when Russia responds defensively, we point the finger at Russia, portraying Russia as a volatile and dangerous aggressor, justifying big military appropriation bills and the Cold War arms race. All right? That's the same old game. It's a get you, get you, get game. Same old game, done thousands of years to start wars. All right, that's it for that lecture.